and the question is, why do people hate Israel so much? Why is there so many people who are poor Palestinians? Think about Europe today. Think about, um, I mean, Europe is dominantly anti-Israel. I mean, I, I, I go to, I, I speak at the UK all the time. And the dominant people who, who, who are trying to obstruct my speeches and stop me, even though I'm not speaking about Israel, are pro-Palestinian groups. Um, you know, in, in the U.S., I think that the number of people who are anti, particularly among the young anti-Israel, is growing. The, 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 this uh, boycott Israel movement is growing. And then there's the whole libertarian anti-Israel phenomena, which is just mind-boggling to me. It, it, you know, not really, if you understand what libertarianism is, but it goes against kind of their idea that they are pro-individualism, which at the end of the day, they're not. So it, what, what, what is your perspective on, on, the, on why people are so anti-Israel and pro-Palestinian? I think it goes to a moral premise that's prevalent in the culture. And I think it connects with both of those communities, both the sort of idealistic students and if you want to put another category, the sort of the, the libertarians that you're referring to, if you think of them as libertarians, and it's not clear what that really means. Yeah, exactly. but so if you take students, and I've been on college campuses and I met a lot of these students, and um, part of what happens is this. So the moral premise in our culture is that there's a kind of um, – sort of, you know, your attention, the premise is altruism, as, I, as Ayn Rand describes it. And I think it takes many forms. One of those forms is it, it programs people's thinking to be oriented to who's the sufferer, who's the underdog, who's down. And that matters. That's where your attention should go. And if someone is strong or productive or whatever virtues they actually have, real virtues we're talking about, then that's already suspicious, maybe even necessarily a problem. And you see this both in economic terms and you see it in foreign policy. And, and what happens is that if that's the sort of framing you bring to this issue, a lot of times you don't even look at the, the history. What you know is, wow, I feel really bad for the people suffering in Gaza. And look how poor they are. And Israel is so much stronger militarily and it's punching down and we're helping them. And the Palestinians have this whole history of, and, and some of it is definitely something they, they accentuate and it's a big part of their propaganda. Is we're the victims here and we deserve your sympathy. And so if you're an idealistic person, the ideals that animate you often are, well, I, I believe in doing right and I believe in the good. And that means concern with the suffering. And well, then sort of there's a default position that it's got to be that the Palestinians have got something on their side. And the Israelis, well, they're stronger, so we've got to be suspicious. And then if you fill that in with some of the arguments you hear from the sort of pro-Palestinian side of the, the Palestinian movement's argument, then it kind of reinforces that moral, what I think of as a prejudice, really. It's a prejudice against the productive and the able in favor of the needy and the suffering. And my, part of what I argue in the book is that that's a corruption of the concept of justice. Like justice tells you not find the weakest person and be sympathetic to them, because you can find lots of weak, small groups that are evil. Like the, you know, if you think of the jihadists, there are way fewer jihadists in the world than there are if you count every soldier in the U.S. Army. That doesn't mean you're sympathetic to the jihadists. Or, you know, the, and then there are actually victims who are the underdog in a certain sense, who are innocent victims. So th there's no necessary connection between being weak and small and suffering and actually having justice on your side. They don't go together necessarily. So what you have to do is actually judge um, and separate that out. And so what, what I think helps, what causes a lot of students and people on campus to be swept up in this is one part idealism informed by this kind of altruistic perspective that they've got to have. And, and you know, the news coming out of this conflict is, is colored by this too. Like look at all the people in Gaza who don't have water and like, oh, their houses are bombed out. Okay, but, but well, why are their houses bombed out? What is the conflict really about? What do they believe needs to happen to their opponents? And, and talk about doing? altruism, just because you mentioned water. Israel is supplying them with the water. <laughs> Whatever water they have in Gaza is being supplied by Israel, who has developed technology to, to desalinate the ocean. There's no water supply in Gaza other than what they get from Israel, which is an act of ultimate altruism because they, they're giving water to people dedicated to killing them. Yeah, and, and electricity flows and they control that. And there's all kinds of ways in which that is playing out. Now, if you want to talk about the other side of this, so another, 
It's, this, let's, let's make sure everyone understands. These two camps don't exhaust the sources of hostility to Israel, but they're significant for our, this audience because, I mean, and I think there's something good about what draws students to this perspective because it's the right premise to be on. Like you want to be on the side of the right. Yep. But how they think about what right and wrong and how to judge is that's a problem. That's what the book's trying to fix. Now, if you talk about the libertarian side, now I think of that as a very fuzzy term. Yep. And I think there are at least two issues going on and they're both ultimately philosophical issues. One is there's definitely people who are on that kind of think of themselves as libertarian whose moral perspective just is an altruistic perspective. They don't come at it. They don't come at their political philosophy from, I believe in, rational egoism and I, I'm an individualist to the core. Therefore, I think we need capitalism, which is Ayn Rand's perspective. Like her, for her, capitalism is the consequence of having a rational ethics yep. that's individualist. And so their view is, well, libertarianism best solves for serving the needy in society. Or, or their view is that, well, we need some sort of accommodation for the, the poor and suffering because that's their moral outlook, whether they recognize it or not. And that th predisposes them to think, well, you know, there's a whole bunch of poor people and they're suffering and then we've got to have some concern with that. And then the other thing that goes on for many people who identify as libertarian is there's a kind of, not, this is certainly not true of all of them because there's really good people that I, I respect and we think of this as libertarian, but there's this view of government as a, an, an evil. Yeah. <laughs> and my view- In of is, itself, no matter yeah. what its character is, yes. Right, and, and my view is government's a necessary good, and it, that's why it's so important that you have a right kind of government. And so you look at the Middle East and you think, well, look how controlling Israel, look how strong it is, and, and we don't like that. That's a bad thing. It's a government that's successful. We don't want any part of that. Yeah. And it's this view that government is inherently a problem, and, and there's other reasons they like, but to me, it's, it, it's not having a view of morality driving your political views. I think um, that's right. Now, there's and, an interesting think, piece. Yeah. Sorry, there's an interesting piece I read a while ago from I forget it's maybe the 60s or 70s by um, the famous anarchist libertarian. I think Murray Rothbard. I think maybe that. So he has a piece where he he talks about Israel and the Palestinians, and one of the things he really ha kind of emphasizes is that it's. Um, I mean, there's definitely sympathy to the Palestinians in that argument article, and it's surprising because. The whole setup for the article, I forget the title, is we need, we need deeper thinking on this issue. And the whole thing is incredibly superficial. It's like these are freedom fighters and Israel is just this is a kind of re religious tyranny. And it, even at the time, that wasn't true. So yeah. there's just willful, um, unthinking approaches to this that I think are part of the problem. So. Yeah, no, I definitely think I think it, I think the libertarian subjectivism there is again, some libertarians, their, their altruism. They haven't abandoned altruism. They 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 consistently. So somebody here is complaining about Israel bombing children or bombing uh, you know bombing houses and so on. I mean, really, you, you're trying to defend yourself, and therefore you're not gonna you're not gonna bulldoze. You're not gonna bomb. You're not gonna kill the people who are trying to kill you. You you just stand there waiting. So there's a pacifist element, mm -hmm. but I think all of it uh, what underlies much of these uh, anarchist perspective is really hatred, hatred of the good. It, it's a certain, they hate America. I mean, Rothbard, it comes out of this Rothbardian view that there's nothing worse than the American government. The American government is the worst. Stalin is better than America. And um, yeah, and if Stalin is better than America, then Palestinians are better than Israel. It, so it's, it's hatred of any government that is somewhat successful, right? Even a little bit because they're successful. So there really is envy and, and nihilism and all driven by kind of a, a horrible, horrible moral subjectivism. And then I would add, particularly in Europe, but I think also more and more here, that there's, there's definitely anti-Semitism, yeah. definitely an anti-Jewish aspect to all of this because they don't listen to facts. They, you know, they, when, when uh, anybody else can defend themselves, Right, uh, 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 France can go to North Africa right. and bomb in Mali and, and bomb terror, you know, the, the Islamists and kill women and children, and nobody cares. The French certainly don't care. But Jews defending themselves, that is completely unacceptable. That we cannot tolerate. You know, if, 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 if Mexico was bombarding uh, a city on, on, you know, San Diego, 
would anybody be overly concerned, Americans, about where the bombs were hitting in Mexico? The, the whole premise that they live under is uh, there's, a, there's a different attitude towards Israel because they're Jews. Not everybody, but, but from some people, it, it, there's absolutely no question, uh, no question that they do this. So some people, why did France bomb Mali? Because Mali is a haven of Islamists, and the Islamists were attacking France. And France went into Mali is a former French colony, I think. And, uh, and they went in there and it, it, to help the government defeat the Islamists. And it, France has been involved in Northern Africa for a long, long time, justifiably or unjustifiably. My point is, all over the world, people are killing each other. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. But, but Israel kills anybody, and it makes the headlines in every major newspaper in the world. Yeah, I mean, one interesting data point that people can look up is around the time of the first Gaza war, I think it was 80, 2008, 2009, which, and that led to a whole UN inquiry about war crimes and so forth. Around that time, Sri Lanka was winding down. It's, there's an insurgency in Sri Lanka. And the way they, they ended this insurgency was through what's called total war. They just killed tens of thousands of people. And it was a crazy amount of, 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 uh, of death. And I forget exactly the timing of this, but it was around this time that Israel was being, you know, pulled over the rakes for its conduct in Gaza. And, and I write about this in the book too. But how much did you hear about what happened in Sri Lanka, which proportionally in terms of human lives and the cost and the, and the amount of time it took and, and the, the, even the conduct you might criticize? You, I don't think you heard nearly the same amount about Sri Lanka as you did in terms of what Israel did, uh, which was, you know, in numerical terms, much smaller. And the wider point is that this issue of the anti-Semitism that you're referring to, which I think one of the greatest manifestations of it, which really reflects a global perspective, is what happens at the UN. So there is, in the, I don't know, 10 or so year, however long it's been that there's been a United Nations Human Rights Commission. There used to be a different body, but ever since they reformed it, and, and it's as a rule, they have singled out Israel more than they have singled out any other country, including countries where we see people being killed in the streets, like Iran, and we've seen it in um, in Venezuela and and in all all parts of the world. Those countries aren't given the same kind of treatment, and part of it is this dynamics within the UN, which is, is heavily dominated by these dictatorial regimes and, and sympathetic regimes to them. But there is definitely a kind of, um, you know, you, sometimes it's put in terms of double standards, but I think it's, it's, it's worse than a double standard because it's, it's, it's giving a special negative focus to one country because it isn't like the, the, they hold it to a higher standard. Those, there, the, there's arguments about whether you would hold it to a higher standard, but it isn't even that. It's just, well, who are they to do this kind of thing in the first place? Um, and you know, it is, um, anti-Semitism is not a topic I get into much in the book, but you and I have talked about it and you've given talks on the subject. And one of the things that people, I think, really need to appreciate is this is a long-standing phenomenon and it isn't really about religion <laughs> in the sense that it's, you can, there, there were cases in Europe and so part of what led to the, growth of Zionism, the idea that Jews have to have a country, is that there were secular, assimilated Jews in Europe, meaning they were indistinguishable culturally and intellectually from the people that they grew up with in Germany or France or, or, or Austria. And independent of all that, they were still pointed to in the street and called a Jew. Why? Because there's a kind of tribal, collective, and a racial component to it that you could, never, like, you could never get out of it. And this is part of why, and you look at the way the Nazis defined Jews, it had to do with heredity, independent of whether you go to synagogue or not. And I'm actually a fairly militant atheist, in my view, <laughs> as, as, as atheists go. And I, I, when I was growing up, I was true too. And people still pointed to me, and I got all kinds of anti-Jewish uh, yeah. uh, criticism and things like that. So there's a phenomenon that, deserves real attention and it isn't and it's separable from what israel does but it's now compounded by the fact that there's a whole country that people can point to and use as a whipping boy for this issue 